program created by Rio Grande. Kern County Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 229 regarding a robbery on the highway near Tupman. Suspect described as two American, 5 feet 10 and 5 feet 6, weight about 150, 160 pounds. These men are armed and dangerous. That's all. Rolls and quest. here to stay, or is it just a passing fancy? That's what they said in the days when axle grease was thought to be an adequate lubricant. But modern high-speed motors demand the modern lubricant that really lubricated, and the answer to that demand today is found in the new streamlined motor oil Rio Lube. It contains no petroleum wax or jelly, no carbon-forming elements, no sludge or other foreign matter. Because Rio Lube is impervious to both intense heat and freezing temperatures, it is possible for you to use a lighter weight oil, thus reducing oil drag and increasing your gasoline mileage. Because Rio Lube can't break down, because Rio Lube provides complete lubrication the instant you step on the starter with even a cold motor, you have maximum protection against wear and friction at all times in any kind of weather. When you turn into your nearest red and white Rio Grande station for your regular supply of cracked gasoline, get acquainted with Rio Lube, the newest and finest oil in this market. It will prolong the life of your motor and pay you dividends with safer, more economical motoring. It is our pleasure and privilege to welcome to Calling All Cars, Sheriff Ed Champlin of Kern County. Sheriff Champlin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The story we ought to hear tonight was one that required probably more work than any other case in the history of my department. The cost of apprehending the criminals was greater than the money they realized from all their robberies. And it would be impossible to enumerate all the persons who worked on the case or to tell the details of the work they did in bringing these men to justice. Coupled with these facts was the added one that these men were dangerous, desperate criminals who had vowed they would not be taken alive. No one of my deputies or the federal agents working on the case knew what moment he would be looking into the business end of the bandits' gun. Yet none of the officers involved hesitated in his search for the robbers. I believe that this case shows most conclusive, conclusively that no matter how smart a crook thinks he is, he still can't beat the game. Our scene is a street in Taft, California. The year is 1924. Now look, Crockett, you park right by the corner there and I'll go in. Give me about 30 seconds to get inside, then you pull up and park directly in front of the door, across the corner. You get it? Yeah. Leave that on our hand in the car, at the wheel. And you come in as soon as you see me at the teller's window. Okay. Eleanor, you have this jalopy ready to scram out of here when we come out. Yeah, it'll be ready. That uh, cheap load, and maybe lead flying. Hey, don't worry about me. Watch yourself. Cut the game. Come on. Oh, uh, yeah? See if it's good enough for you to give me that dough you got in that drawer. Uh, yes? Come on, come on, get a move on. Yeah. And don't make any funny moves. That guy standing just inside the door is my buddy, see? He'll blast you out of that cage if you start anything. I, I won't start anything. Here's the money. Is that all of it? Yes, sir. Okay. You stay where you are with your back turned for ten minutes. Oh, oh, all right. And you better forget what I look like. If you want to live and do well. Get a move on, Bob. Keep your shot down. Look out, Bob. The guy's going to shoot. Oh, yeah? Let him have it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Once again, nervous tension on the part of a criminal foiled his aim, and no casualties resulted from the encounter in the bank. Witnesses obtained the license number of the bandit car, and additional information obtained by investigators resulted in the arrest of the trio. Taylor and the girl pleaded guilty, implicating Crockett. But Crockett demanded a jury trial. 
Has the jury reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. You'll read the verdict of the jury. We, the jury, find the defendant, William Crockett, not guilty. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is the most incomprehensible verdict I have ever received in my long experience as a presiding officer of this court. You are dismissed. The defendant is discharged. <laughs> Our scene shifts to Los Angeles two years later. In the shadows of a darkened room in a cheap hotel, two shadowy figures sit, silently waiting. At last, after hours of vigil, a key is fitted to a lock, and a creaking door swings open. A lone figure stands silhouetted in the doorway. From the darkened room comes a voice. Come on in, Crockett, with your hands in the air. Well, who are you? What do you want? Little matter of bank robbery, I want to ask you about. Oh, no, you don't. I beat that rap last year. Oh, no, you didn't. You haven't been tried for this one yet. It just happened this afternoon. Uh, you can't pin this on me. Then that's what you think. One of the tellers at the bank remembered your picture from that circular on the Taft job two years ago. He identified you as the man that held up the bank at Melrose and Bronson this afternoon. You won't beat this rap, Crockett. <laughs> was right. Crockett did not beat that rap. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to San Quentin to serve one to 25 years for bank robbery. It is July 23rd, 1936. Two men are sitting in a small car beside a lonely road near Tupman, California. Sir, the L.A. boys put you away, did they, Bill? Yeah. Well, I figured the world owes me a living. I'm going to get it the easiest way I can. Yeah, me too. But I'm fighting shy of dames from now on, boy. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Don't kid me, pal. I know you young mugs better than that. Ah, uh, forget it. Hey, uh, what time is it? Well, uh, look. 9.30. Well, that uh, truck ought to be here pretty soon, huh? Yeah, pretty soon. Keep your shirt up. Uh-uh. I think I see it now. Yeah, that's it, all right. Come on, get your motor started. Don't forget. Take it easy and let him pass. Oh, he's making good time. He said it. All right, get going. Now try to catch him just under the bluff by the bend in the river. Okay. Pull alongside. Pull over and stop that truck. Pull in front of him, Bill. Okay, buddy. Get out of there. We're taking over. You get into a lot of hot water pulling stunts like this. Yes, sir. But... Never mind the conversation. That's throwing the mail out here. Okay, buddy. It's in the back end. Get him move on. Keep your shirt on, kid. Get the truck unlocked, fella. I will. As soon as I find my key. Well, hurry up. Here it is. All right. Now get in there and throw them sacks out here. Don't rush. Yo, Hayden. You guys are wasting a lot of time. I haven't any money. Oh, yeah? Well, that's our hard luck. Get the mail out here. Here she comes. Come on, come on faster. Get him out here. Get him out here. As the heavy sacks of mail were dumped on the ground, the bandits slit each sack and quickly searched for packages that might contain money or securities. At last, apparently satisfied with their haul, they drove away, leaving the driver to reload his cargo and report the holdup. The news of the holdup spread like wildfire, and within a few minutes, every road in Kern County was being guarded. Deputy Sheriffs Acton Jensen and Glenn Roberts sped to Tupman to question the driver. My name's Jensen from the Sheriff's Office. This is Glenn Roberts. How do you do? Good to know you. The Bakersfield Post Office phoned us he'd been held up out here. Yes, sir. They get much? Well, as far as I know, they didn't get anything except a couple of packages of letters. They missed the pouch that had the money in it. How much money were you carrying? About fifty thousand dollars. Well, how come they missed it? Well, they didn't know the difference between a mail sack and a pouch. They ripped open all the sacks with a knife. When I saw that they didn't know what they were looking for, I tossed the pouch out and threw two or three sacks on it, and they passed it up. In a hurry, eh? It seemed to be. What kind of car were they driving? Plymouth Coupe. Gray. You got the license? Didn't have one. Have guns? Yep, both of them. Get a good look at them? No. Had masks on. What kind? 
Look like silk stockings with part of them cut off. You notice anything peculiar about either of them? They both wore cotton gloves. One of them was sort of bald and had a grayish fringe of hair. How about the other one? Here's a younger fella. How were they dressed? Both of them had on overalls. One of them, the younger one, had on new clothes, and the other, the older man, had on a faded outfit. Anything else? Well, when they started away, they backed up to get on the road, and they ran the handle of the door on the truck into the door of the coupe. Must have sprung it the way they hit it. Well, this is going to be simple. Just find a gray coupe with a sprung door. Had new tires on it, too. Look at it like a new car. Well, Glenn, I guess that's about all we can get here. Let's go back and file a report of this thing. Cooperating with postal investigators, deputies from the office of Sheriff Champness began a systematic check of all cars answering the description of that driven by the bandits. Lists were obtained from manufacturers, checked with distributors, and rechecked with dealers to ascertain the number of such cars already sold. Forest ranger stations were contacted to determine that suspects had entered any restricted areas. As days drifted by, rumor after rumor sent sheriff's deputies scurrying to remote sections of the state in search of the bandits, but always without success. Then, shortly after noon on August 21st, 1936, into the Bank of America at Maricopa, California, walked a man. At the curb in front of the bank sat a small sedan with a younger man at the wheel. The masked figure, gun in hand, advanced toward the lone teller on duty. The teller realized a holdup was imminent and without hesitating, fired point blank at the intruder. Once again, sheriff and deputies sped to the scene of the crime, but a duplication of the mail truck holdup was produced. No information regarding the identity of the bandits could be obtained. Then, on the night of December 4th, 1936, the telephone in the sheriff's office jangled a piercing alarm. Sheriff's office, Lyon speaking. Police department. Got any spare deputies lying around the place? A few? Why? Well, we just had a holdup over here at the travel inn. Like to have a few of your boys to help round up the bandits. Sure thing. When did it happen? Just the same. 
that Samir. But this man's in San Quentin, sentenced for bank robbery from Los Angeles. Look, Eck, maybe he's out on parole. He was sent up in 1926. This is 36. Maybe he's out. Well, we soon find out. But where's your phone, Mr. Hamlin? Right on the counter there. Thanks. I'll have the office shoot a wire to San Quentin. Give me the sheriff's office, please. Say, this begins to make our hunch look good. Why didn't we think about this monkey people? Uh, hello, Lyons. Listen, Bill. Get a teletype off to San Quentin and find out if a convict by the name of William Crockett is still up there. If he's not there, find out when and where he was paroled. Yeah, got a pretty good lead. We'll be back in a couple of hours. Well, we'll soon have the dope on Mr. Crockett. And if he's in this neck of the woods, we'll get him. And when we do, we'll nab his partner, too. <laughs> Kern County Sheriff's Office, word came back that William Crockett had been paroled to an employer in Petaluma, California. Further investigation disclosed that the parole authorities had no knowledge of the location of Crockett, but were sure the man had not left his parole employment or the county where he had been paroled. But even as this information was being received, another scene was being enacted in the little town of Shafter. It is mid-afternoon, December 28th, two days after the oil deal crime. All right, Bill. I we'll work the same routine on this baby that we did at Maricopa. Yeah, I'll be ready when you come out, see? And this time, get the check, will you? Don't let him argue out of it. Maybe you'd rather go in and get it. Well, it's okay by me, buddy. Oh, uh, yeah? Well, save it. Come on, get that motor going. All right. Reach for that. <laughs> Look out. He's got a gun. Right the first time, mister. This is again. I'll use it on the first part that makes a funny move, see? Hey, you in the cage there. Get that money into this suitcase and make it snappy. Do you mind if I put my wife down? She's fainted. Nah, drop her. Get a move on back there. That's better. Now, shove it along the floor to me. Nah, nah, not your wife. I'm in the suitcase, Slug. Yeah. Well, that's better. Now, stay where you are, all of you. I'll plug the first guy that makes a move. He's gone. Hey, where are you going with that gun? He said stay here. Think I'm going to stand here and let him get away with that? Did you hit him? I don't think so. But I got the license number of that car they were driving. Bit by bit, the information possessed by the sheriff's office was growing. At last... They had a tangible clue, the license number of the bandit car. This car proved to be stolen, however, and again the blockade system was brought into play. Every road was watched day and night, not only by sheriff's deputies, but by the Bakersfield Police Department and the Highway Patrol. Telegraph and teletype wires, telephone and radio flashed the news to every peace officer in California. Complete descriptions of the bandits, every piece of information collected through the long months of search went speeding to law enforcement agencies. Then at 10 o'clock on the night, Following the hold-up, the car was found abandoned near Bakersfield. Hey, Snare, we had time to look over that stuff you found in that car? Not all of it. We're busy right now checking the prints we found on the car against our files. What have you found out? Well, Glenn Roberts had a hunch that the fingerprints we got on Bill Crockett might match some of those we found on the car. He's working on that now. How are you coming, Glenn? Looks like they checked to me. Come take a look at him. I'd like to get a line on the bird who's working with Crockett on these jobs. Assuming it is Crockett. Here, and let me take a look at that print. Hmm. I'd say it was the same print. Yeah, it looks like it to me. Say, wasn't the name of that fellow we had trouble with that other time Crockett was picked up? Uh, wasn't his name Taylor? By George, I believe you're right. Let's pull all the cards we have on the Taylors we've got. He was a man about, uh, well, he'd be about 50 now. He weighed around 150, didn't he? That's the one. That fits the descriptions we've been getting, too. Boy, maybe we're going to get somewhere on this case yet. If I remember rightly, this Crockett bird used to run around with a girl who lives back in the hills. I think her name was Green or something like that. Well, here we are. Robert Taylor, alias Scotty Taylor. One to 25 years for bank robbery in 1924 from Taft. That's the man. There's his mug picture. Run me off a handful of these mugs. Get me a bunch of pictures. Include Crockett's in them. I'm going to see those hold-up witnesses again. 
Pictures of the two suspects were readily identified by the victims of the bandits. Identification certain telegraph wires carried the news to every part of the country. Prisons were contacted where the two men had been confined. Every bit of correspondence carried on with the ex-convicts and every address was checked. Crockett's relatives were located in Reno, and as quickly as Sheriff Champness' messages reached there, word came back that Crockett had been seen there and had taken a plane to San Francisco. Deputy Jensen interviewed a taxi driver. Yes, sir. I know who you mean. I didn't know who he was then, but see, I got a call from a dame to meet the 4 o'clock plane from Frisco. I met the plane, and this guy had me driving back up into the hills north of town. Yeah, that's all I know. Honest. Other deputies raced to the airport only to be told. Sure, I remember a guy getting off the plane this morning at 4. A taxi was here to meet him, and they drove off, headed north. Crockett's former girlfriend was brought in for questioning. We want to know where Bill Crockett is. I don't know where he is. You've seen him lately? Sure. When? Yesterday. What time? About 5 o'clock, maybe 4.30. Where was he when we were out there? I don't know. you know where his folks are? His mother's in Los Angeles, somewhere. Nowhere? No. Did you ever hear of harboring a criminal? No. Well, you're going to. That's what we're going to put you in jail for. You can't do that to me. That's what you think. Come on. No, uh, wait a minute. I'm married, see? Uh, I don't want no trouble about this. Want to tell us about Crockett? Will you let me go? Maybe. All right, then I lied to you. I do know where he is. Rather where he said he'd be. Okay, let's have it. He's gone north. Where to? Seattle, Washington. Know the address? No, but he's going to write me. Okay, we'll watch for a letter. Now, how'd he get away from your place? My father-in-law's car. What kind of a car? Plymouth, sort of gray. Coupe? Yeah. With new tires? Yeah, why? Never mind. Did Crockett say where Taylor is? Yeah, he said he was staying in a joint on 5th Street, close to Los Angeles and... On Sandra Street in uh, L.A. Sure of that? Sure I am. Okay. Go on home and keep quiet about this. In the meantime, every known underworld hideout was contacted. Word was passed that it was unhealthy to be seen with either Taylor or Crockett. The bandits were hot. Hello, Sam. You got a spare room? Ain't no room at all. San Diego for you, Scotty. You're hot. Hiya, pal. How's tricks? Big snay on the I'll pay off stay. Hamstray, you're hot. Guy hot. Oh, no. How long you been in Frisco? Long enough to know how to keep away from birds as hot as you are. So long, buddy. Hiya, Daisy. How do you like Seattle? Fine, till you showed up. Scram, monkey, you're hot. Thus, Bill Crockett and Scotty Taylor seemed to be feared by their erstwhile pals and associates. Everywhere they turned, the answer was the same. Scram, buddy, you're hot. Beat a big boy, you're hot. Come on, move on, you're looking for no cell, you're hot. Amscray, I'll pay. Amscray, you're hot. 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 moved on. Every piece of mail addressed to friends or associates of the suspect was checked. Their suspected hideouts were watched day and night. Since the crime at Oildale had been against the postmaster and the robbery of the bank at Shaster had also crossed federal jurisdiction, G-men and postal inspectors had entered the case. In San Diego, where they had gone to check a new angle of the case, deputies Jensen and Roberts ascertained the hideout address in Los Angeles of Scotty Taylor. Immediately, a stakeout was placed on the house by federal agents. Keep your eye on that window. The third room from the corner. That's his room. I'm going to cross the street. He ought to be coming out pretty soon. Okay, I'll watch. Signal if he comes out. Never mind. There he comes now. Let's get over there. Careful now. He step on the left and I'll take the right. Okay. Hey, what's coming off here? Get your hands off of me. Take it easy, Taylor. We're federal officers and we're taking you in. Oh, gee, fellas, you... You got me wrong. I ain't Scotty Taylor. No, you got the wrong man. Yeah, we've heard that one before, too. Oh, honest, my name ain't Taylor. It's, uh, it's Crockett. Uh, yeah, well, that's it, Crockett. Fine. You see, we're looking for Crockett, too. Yeah? 
Well, what do you know about that? Mm, you see, Taylor, either way you lose. I know I had something against the name of Crockett. <laughs> An intercepted letter to Crockett's former sweetheart sent messages flying to Seattle. In the hallway of a cheap rooming house in Seattle, two sinister figures paused before a door. Got that key? Yeah, here it is. Let's go in. Got your flashlight? Yeah, yeah. Uh, nobody at home. Well, we'll wait. Better lock the door. Well, this looks like the beginning of a long, hard winter. Smoke? Better not, he might smell it. Time is it by your watch? Uh, let's see. 11.30. Uh, been here an hour. Yeah. Did you hear anything? No. Listen. Yeah. Somebody coming up the stairs. He's coming this way. Yep. That tall man. He stopped. Keep your hands right where they are, Crockett. And don't turn on the lights. Uh, you, you, what do you want? Federal officers. G-men to you, Crockett. Taking you along for a little bank job you pulled at Shafter. Down in California. And a post office robbery at Oildale, remember? Why, you got me wrong, listen. Don't Arnold. tell us you're Scotty Taylor. Well, you yeah. well, sure. Yeah, that's right. Hey, how did you know? Simple. We're quick at such things. As a matter of fact, we arrested Scotty last week in Los Angeles. He told us he was Bill Crockett. Maybe he's right, but maybe you both are. Just the same, we're taking you to jail. Come on, get gone. In just a moment, we shall hear again from Sheriff Champness. Last... In choosing an outfit for the Easter parade, you wouldn't be so foolish as to select shoddy material if you could get the finest of broadcloth for the same price. For the same reason, the average motorist will dress up his car for any and all occasions with real lube motor oil. Why use shoddy lubricants when the newest and finest, with a matchless texture that can't be worn thin by the fastest driving in the hottest weather, costs no more? The answer is sure to find you driving into the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood the very next time you need an oil change. Think of it, friends, only 25 cents a quart for real lube the newest and finest motor oil, the fitting companion product for Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And now, Sheriff Chapman. Less than an hour after Scotty Taylor and Bill Crockett were in jail in Bakersfield, where they had been brought by federal agents, my men had assembled 15 witnesses to their crimes, and the suspects had been positively identified. Confronted with the evidence gathered by the officers who worked on the case, the two men confessed and pleaded guilty to the shafter and then the two men confessed and pleaded guilty to the shafter and then Oildale holdup. Additional charges are placed Oildale holdup. Additional charges are placed against them as holds in order that they may be made to serve their sentences in prison. It has cost them 25 years of their lives to learn that crime doesn't pay. Thank you, Sheriff Chapman. County Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation of broadcast 229 regarding a robbery. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quotes. 